Today we're joined by another behavioral engineer. And it is a perfect term because Greg Hartley started out in the military, was an interrogator. As an interrogator, he had to be able to read body language because he didn't know if he was being effective or not. And ultimately, he is with us today. He trains businesses. He is a consultant for television. How are you doing today, Greg? Doing great, Eric. How about you? Fantastic. I'm really excited to have you on. I've wanted to have you on for a while. You work with a previous guest, Scott Rouse. Yes, yeah, Scott and I met a couple of years ago, I guess. It seems like a couple of years. I guess we've been at it about five years. We've got a couple of ventures together. We're working on a book together right now, a uh, liar book. And we have a, a, a site with subscription body language micro courses called bodylanguagetactics.com. So we've worked together. Yes. He's a body language guy, more of a police interrogator. Mine is ex resistance trainer, uh, ops guy. I work special. I worked as a special forces support interrogator in the first Gulf War, for example. So mine is a little more prisoner of war, a little more terror. His is more police and you know, crime, local, local stuff. You know what? This is fantastic. Let's go right there because that was one of my questions that I was contemplating while researching, and I consider that interrogating a suspect or a criminal, they're not always the same, That's right. is different than interrogating an enemy combatant or soldier. And I'll tell you my interpretation, you can tell me if I'm completely off, but like I've had Jack Barsky on, who was a KGB agent. I don't consider him evil. I consider him to be a patriot. Got a job, right? He's just, he works for the other side. How do you reconcile um, so we sh a criminal or suspect versus a soldier? Well, the first thing is a soldier either is conscripted and forced to do a job or they have signed up and they're a patriot and they're doing a job to protect something they hold dear. I'll, I'll even take it a step further and people have been angry at me for saying this before, but if you can't understand the mindset of a terrorist who is willing to blow himself up for a cause, you can't interrogate because you're, you're too narrow-minded and you're too focused on considering them all the same person, and that's not the case. Now, there's a certain thing that causes a terrorist to go and go into the suicide bomber thing, but prisoners of war typically are not the same. There are there are crazies and criminals there too, but they're not typically the same. Large numbers of them are patriots, just like you said. In many cases, they may have had a day job doing X, Y, or Z before they joined up for the military. You never know. I mean, imagine if. God rest his soul, Patrick Tillman had been captured and interrogated. Is he a criminal or a bad guy? He's the guy who gave up millions of dollars to him to defend his country. And so you have to think of it that way to be a good and effective prisoner of war interrogator, if that makes sense to you. Oh, absolutely. Because I, I think about it, and to get even tighter with it, Alder James and Robert Hansen are traitors, and they can go rot in hell. Yeah, and they're criminals. But Jack Barsky, he is a spy. They work for the same people. Yep. <laughs> in the end, but but Barsky did it legitimately. He was born there, and you know he was a countryman, and I have no issue with it. So, how do you handle them then? How, how do you approach it, or and have you approached both kinds before? Well, yeah, and here's the key, right? I don't. I'm not typically involved in traitor interrogations because U.S. military is prohibited by you know, statute from interrogating American citizens. That's typically the case. Mm. When you do, it's only because they're swept up in some other group. And you end up getting your hands on them and finding out. But when I've talked to Iraqis, and, and a lot of the Iraqi soldiers in the first Gulf War, for example, were conscripts. There were guys on crutches who had never, who had not been able to walk in years who were Saddam and forced into action. So when you're talking to those guys, every one of them is different because all people are different. You have to poke and prod and find the makeup of the person. And most of what I, you know, the body language for me is more about understanding why someone's doing something. And when they're trying to cover some piece of information, same thing I do in my, in my day job now when I go to corporations, look for why they're hiding it. Most people are not criminals, although people may do bad things, they get themselves into position. On the other hand, people like Ames and folks like that, they engineer their way to that mess and they are bad guys. And I'm with you. They rot in hell to put Americans in harm's way for that. Yeah, that's interesting that you said that. So essentially, it's almost like a, a slippery slope type of deal. Nobody's really a villain in their own story. Right. Yeah. No, humans are really, I would say, I feel like Jane Goodall among chimps, except for I'm a chimp too. The coolest <laughs> thing about humans is that anything we do enough feels normal. That's the bad thing about a human being. 
So if you put yourself in a place that you repeatedly do something enough, it will start to feel normal and okay. It's how people get past all the horrendous acts they do to other people. You know, we talked, Mm -hmm. when you talk about psychopaths and the things they do, well, they have no feelings for it. Anybody can get hardened to, to torment or doing that kind of thing. I taught resistance to interrogation for four years when I was in my 20s. And in that compound, we had psychologists looking at us, not at, not at the prisoners, but at us, because the natural tendency yeah. of people is to ramp up aggression over time. And we were physical with our prisoners. So we were teaching them what to do if they were captured. And they paid very close attention to us because their level of violence would ramp up if we were not cautious, for example. This is like the Stanford uh, prison experiment, right? Or, or worries about it. And I know that's been possibly debunked. Yeah, so but... I actually talked to Phil Zimbardo after the Abu Ghraib thing because he predicted that all of that Abu Ghraib stuff, everything that happened. Really, he didn't mm. talk about it specifically, but his, his study certainly was just right on exactly what it was. But that's it is... You know, humans, I have a book called um, Become an Expert Only Thing in Two Hours. And I just say humans are designed to look up constantly. The Maslow thing, looking constantly to someone who's better. It just happened that the guy, and I'll forget his name now, who was the ringmaster of Abu Ghraib, was the only real prison guard in the whole bunch because reservists are the army's prison guards. And this guy happened to be a prison guard at a maximum security and th- so even though he was only in E4, everybody looked up to him and they started emulating his behavior. And he was kind of a loose cannon. So that ramp up, it was predictable from what Zimbardo had done. But where I was working, of course, was SEER, survival, evasion, resistance, mm-hmm. escape. We were teaching operators and those guys how to, how to resist interrogation. And they watched us very closely because we're hands on. You know, we're whacking people and capturing and very harsh, harsh environment for the worst environment the Army has. Well, and I, I've got to go right to it then, uh, waterboarding. Yeah, so do I think waterboarding is effective? No. Well, I, did you use it? One, did it get used on our own troops? And sure, sure. do you think it, so let's roll them all together. Just kind of a compound question, yeah. whatever. Okay, yes. Yeah, so waterboarding came out, everything we did in SEER school came out of what yeah. happened to our soldiers in past experience. So when Nick Rowe came back and started the school after being held in a tiger cage for five years in Vietnam, He brought things from the Korean experience, from Japanese torture, from all that stuff. And we would talk to ex-prisoners of war all the time to learn more about their experiences and what it did to their minds and those kinds of things. But waterboarding was certainly part of that. And the Navy used it pretty effectively. I mean, you would think the Navy, water, that's kind of their their little bailiwick. The Army, not as much. But Mm -hmm. waterboarding is one thing. You know, they said Khalid Sheikh Mohammed was was interrogated in waterboard in 43 or whatever the number is. There's right. all you all you're going to do by waterboarding someone is get them to do something or say something. It's not reliable the information you get. And I always say if there was a ticking bomb and you knew it was X or or Y were the options and you had to get an answer and you knew it was one or the other, maybe it's useful then. It's useful to get a person talking. But at the end of the day, torture has proven not to be a reliable form of, of information gathering. We know that. Is it a reliable form of getting someone to talk, to say something? Sure, because someone's going to say whatever it takes to get you to stop what it is. One of the things that most prisoners will tell you is physical torture needs to continue to ramp up because they get accustomed to it. Um, Jeremiah Denton, when hell was in session, if you've read that book, John McCain, those guys would tell you that their Mm -hmm. pain thresholds went through the roof. And it just is what it is. Okay, well, and I wanted to definitely cover that because... I mean, you can't, it's so controversial. There's both sides of it because I know there's a lot of soldiers or SEALs or whatever say, hey, I was waterboarded. Right. I can deal yeah. with it. It's not going to hurt anybody. But I can totally see the other end that if it's nothing but pain and all you'll do is lie or say whatever it takes to make it go away, then that's maybe not actionable intelligence. Well, when I talk agencies, the question is always, what is torture? Where's the line? The simple definition I used, and I taught from 92, 93, until late 2006, seven, right in there I was teaching. And what I would always say is, if it feels like you're hazing, you're torturing. Because if you're mm. pushing someone to quit, which is what hazing is, and they can't quit, there's no limit. Oh. Right? You just keep pushing. So it's a simple, if you can get that, your head through that, 
And I've actually had discussions with Alan Dershowitz on Nightline about torture before. We talked about he mm. believed in torture warrants. I don't believe in that. I think that if an interrogator believes he can get information with torture and goes and does it, then he or she puts their hands in cuffs and gets their day in court if they got information. I don't think that it's good for us to create a new class of people who are allowed to torture because what happens when they can no longer torture and that job is no longer available? And you're setting people up for lots of long, lifelong other problems. So I'm not a fan of torture warrants, for example. Hmm. Yeah, that makes me think of the uh, George Patton um, quotation where he said that I am like one of those creatures in case of, you know, war break glass. Yes. Yeah. Well, and, and, you know, interrogators in their day were, do you know the history of interrogation, how this whole thing came about? No, really. How, go, please. Yeah. So, go. so the most famous interrogator, the guy who created our non-coercive interrogation also created all those sure. mosaics. Yeah. And he created all those mosaics okay. in the, Cinderella's castle down in, in Disney world, believe it or not. Oh, so, okay. And all the mosaics on the LA city hall. He was an artist, but he That's was a range. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. He was, he was, he would tell you if you read his book interrogator that he was kind of a nobody in life until the war broke out world war two. And he, everything about everything. And what you'll find is most interrogators can talk for hours about nothing because we have useless mm -hmm. information. It's what makes you good at what you do. So he was able to make people's stories because they'd say, he would ask, how did you get to Berlin from Vienna? And he, the guy would say, for example, I took the 230 train. He would just smile and say, I know you're lying. I've been on that line 50 times and there is no 230 train. <laughs> so <laughs> he became the father of American interrogation. And all the things that I taught and all the things that we used in the Cold War, for sure, came from on Scharf. Now he wasn't, and this, it's really hard because he was a Nazi. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So it's kind of like, well, he was the friendly Nazi. It's it's yeah. like, is this an extension of Operation Paperclip or something where it's like, well, we know what you were, but you're really good. Yeah. And I think that's the case. I think, well, I don't think he tortured anyone. You know, he's still part of that machine that that mm -hmm. did all of this acts. And I think when they and I, I've not read enough details about how they worked the deal out. But he was the person who established this whole school and changed the way we thought of interrogation. People, you know, as late as the, as World War One, there was no interrogation corps. There were still people, and they warehoused prisoners more than doing anything else with them. Vietnam, we started to see value in human, played human intelligence, played a much larger part in Vietnam than any other war before. And then even in the first Gulf War, where they were not using radios and that kind of thing, it played a huge part. So the, the, the interrogation piece is about getting the person to feel comfortable enough to give you information. I used to say... Um, I sell treason for a living. Well, it, it's funny that you say that. Um, that leads into something else I was considering ahead of time. And that is that interrogation and negotiation are really the same. Or interrogation is a sub form of negotiation. Would you agree? I, I agree. I think what you're doing in, in any good negotiator is changing a person on the axis of action but based on trust. The person believes there's, uh, there's an opportunity there isn't. It's almost a mirror version an interrogator pairs your options and creates the illusion, much like a much like that guy who's negotiating, that there's only one option, it's the option I want. So it's much more controlled. We used to say mm -hmm. in interrogation, I control everything about your life if we're in a cage. You know, I was mm -hmm. I was forward deployed, you don't control everything. You're right, there were people coming out of things and that. But you control everything and so all they have to do is get past you for the hour or two you have to spend with them. And so you need to get them to trust you. So they'll talk is usually how it works. You know, they, in the first Gulf War, they would raise their hand and say, I, I have secrets. <laughs> well, I've heard it's about that. that, that I, I remember the lead up to the first Gulf War, that it was the the ever powerful, super elite Republican guard. Yeah. Yeah. I remember those and, guys. <laughs> no, no. Everybody was really, I mean, I was worried yep. about it. Everybody was very, very worried about I me. Mean, we're talking about, you know, Saddam who killed God knows how many Iranians he poisoned them. He poisoned his people, and these had to be so tough to be his elite guards. And then, when the Americans hit, there were people lined up, handing rifles over, saying, "Food? You they were surrendering for me." That's right. Food, food is a wonderful motivator, <laughs> and, and they were <laughs> surrendering to drones. If that gives you an idea, and reporters. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> if if I can get food, 
you know, we talk to people who would say there are some hard nosed guys who would say, well, I'm prepared to fight forever. Good. He's not. And you just talk to his friend. Mm-hmm. It's the problem is when you have a conscript army and they're only doing something out of fear, they're not effective. And, you know, our the thing about the U.S. military is it's a professional military. Everyone has a calling who's there. They're not forced into duty. It's not slavery. And I think it, it right. shows in our performance. Well, and I was in the army for a minute, too. And really what people get wrong is most soldiers aren't really, quote, patriots. Most soldiers fight for each other. Yes. Once they, once they the fight for their starts. buddies. Yeah, it, it's your buddies in the squad, yep. friends in the platoon. Um, maybe you'll find this amusing. I always did. You could say anything you want about a soldier's mother, but never talk about their home state. <laughs> There's no a friend of mine you should probably meet as well, Jim Pyle, who's a published author and, a, and an interrogator. One of his favorite jokes is only two states in the union really care about their state because you've never, and that's Texas and Alabama, he would always say, because you never heard anybody say, what did you say about Rhode Island? So. <laughs> Oh, there's that, but you forgot Puerto Rico. Which oh, is yeah. a state, but oh, right, right. believe me. <laughs> yeah. More more flags. Yeah, so yeah, I guess when you when you think when you say patriot versus army, you're right. I mean, there are many people who think that everybody is, you know, rabidly patriot. And I, right. when I I was a reserve, an active army reserve guy, the liaison guy who taught for years. And I used to teach these guys, you're a mercenary, you're not in the in the reserves for the right purpose because they're in for college money and so that's human nature, right? And you're going to, even within every unit, you're going to find patriots and then people who are not so patriotic. I agree with you. Yeah, and, and a lot of them become more patriotic over time. Right. But a lot of it is, you know, hey, I, I needed a job. I needed food. Paper wasn't hiring. You know? <laughs> um, well, and in and, my case, I joined the Army to pay for college. I became much more patriotic over time, of course. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Now let's roll into your technique. Okay. You have the read technique. Yep. Is it kind of a play on words yes. against the yeah, yeah. read technique? No, 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 not that read technique. What, what it is, is something simple for people, right? I thought, how do I get something easy for people to put in their heads? So if you review what you're seeing, you analyze it. You know, and when I say review, I'm really talking about take in everything. Just look, Don't, be a child. Stop trying to be Everybody thinks being a body language expert is sexy and it's this and it's that and there's some voodoo and it's going to get you women and money and power and all, all those things. We're swimming in that. You can tell. But the, mm-hmm. the, the, the funny part of it is it's simply looking like a child, paying attention to everything you see and then looking for what's different. That analyze piece, that evaluate piece is starting to put it into buckets. So the review is just take in data. I encourage people when I was teaching, like Intel folks. Just look. Don't try to understand. Just look. Pay attention to what's different. Baseline mm-hmm. and deviation. Then evaluate. Put it into boxes. Understand why that implies why something changed. And then decide what really matters. And so it's not really like a, you're talking the John Reed method, the minimizing me- method. That's a right. power. Well, yeah, it's interrogation. Well, I, like I said, because they're aligned and it's like, hey, same word. It rhymes. Right. It <laughs> rhymes. But re- so when I was when I was trying to put if you write books, you suddenly realize that you're not as smart as you think you are about titles. And every book I've ever written, someone else had a better idea for a title than I did. And so the I Can Read You Like a Book started that, which eventually became The Art of Body Talking, the revision. And those guys had a much better idea for a title than I did. And I tied into their title and worked through that and trying to come up with an acronym. But yeah, it's simple. Um, I just try to pay attention to what your face is doing, your eyes are doing. Your torso is sure. doing, your hands are doing. Well, and that actually leads into another question. Whenever I you know, book somebody, I always say, hey, wh- what books do you want to talk about? Or what things do you want to talk about? You have 10 books, mm-hmm. and you happen to name two of them, and they're not new. Uh, the most dangerous bi- business book you'll ever read right. is one that you pu- um, put up. I think that was 2011. Mm-hmm. And the other one is Get People to Do What You Want. I think that's like 2013 or 14. I can't remember. But why is it those two books? What is special about those books that you want to kind of put them in front? I would say maybe I'm stupid, but it took me 20 years to understand that that what's in get people to do what you want. It really is a simple approach to why people go about the silliness they're doing. If you if you read the book and you stop thinking about it being me trying to tell you how to read body language or manipulate people, 
and just look at what's happening with this coronavirus. You can't miss people doing exactly what the book is about. And that's Maslow's hierarchy and walking up the chain and then pushing to try to get the upper hand, right? That's human nature. So mm -hmm. everything I learned about interrogation, about elicitation, about spy catching, and all of those pieces that I learned from other people, it all ties into that very simple thing. And I take that Maslow's hierarchy, which has been discredited, people will say, but just watch what people do. And I say, you're never dealing with a person in self-actualization. And you, as an average person, are not going to deal with people in safety needs or uh, physical needs. You're going to have belonging mm -hmm. and differentiation, the only two things you're dealing with. And the real masterful part that I learned over the years of interrogating and doing that is simply paring down, we talked about it just a couple of minutes ago in negotiation, paring down mm -hmm. options so that it appears you only have the options I'm offering you. Very simply. And there I call one of those things I call the land room principle after a very famous special forces guy known as a bearded one at Sears School who would, could take, he could talk to you for 10 minutes and make you think you had no choice, even though you just met him except for what he was asking you to do. Really powerful guy. Not ever interrogator trained, just an intel guy. And really, really together. That's the reason for that one. And we just revised that one to take into account. You may or may not have the revision, but we just revised that one to take into account social media because I wrote that book first when MySpace was, was the big deal. And so to give you an idea, we changed it to be around how Facebook and Twitter and all those things impact people as well. So... The, the most dangerous business book, I spend a lot of time with business. And all I did with is I worked with negotiators and I worked with spy catchers and I worked with, you name it, in my 20-ish years of being in the army and working around everything. And all I tried to do was take what they knew and what they used and apply that to the business world. And it's not as harsh as, as you would think. It's mostly about paying attention to people's drives, persuading them to trust you getting the things you need about team building and all those things in, in ways I learned from most people. That one's interesting though, because when, when I was reading it and immediately you get a vibe out of books and that had a total Machiavellian quality to it from the jump. Yeah. And, and it's definitely, a, shall we say, it's not the kinder, gentler body language that. reading book. It, it is a full on, if I'm just, I'm not sure if you've read um, Robert Greene or Robert Cialdini. No. Um, okay, well, Robert Greene wrote a seminal thing called The 48 Laws of Power. And it's like throughout history, how people have managed to take control or whatever. It's much more on the Robert Greene side than the warm and fuzzy um, yeah. Robert Cialdini, which right. is influence, which is kind of the seminal work on that. Well, and I try to say to people, I bring to this something I know from my past. Um, when, when you write, of course, I, I say to people often, there's a Darth Vader costume that comes with writing books like this and people are afraid. And mm. you automatically get to be the softer, kinder guy, really, rather than have to ever, you, you never have to be the hard ass guy, excuse my English, but you never have to be the guy. But I mean, uh, was that a deliberate difference? differentiator, I should say. Yes. Yeah. Because it's yeah. kind of like niching down like, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mark, uh, Mark Bowden, we, yep. we both know yep. who is absolutely so charming. Yes. So just effusive in his behavior. I could never see Mark writing that book. Well, yeah. You know, you dance with the one that brung you, as they say. Right? And I, <laughs> I, I came from 20 years, mostly of military. I, you know, I spent time in infantry battalions, then went off to be an interrogator and then with ops guys and then as a trainer. So what I know and in, in my style, if you look at my old press pictures, that like when I came out of the And mm -hmm. so that was my style. And it's kind of your brand. Right. I, I can't be Mark. Mark is a polished actor and wonderful accent and all of those things. And here I am, we're very, we're a little bit different kind of people, but still have similar skill yeah. sets. Well, I find that I actually enjoy that. And that's why Mark always comes up and Chase Hughes will yep. al almost always come up because I find in the body language world that you have two directions of people that get in it. You have Mark who's coming from the performance side. Yes. And, and a beautiful version of it. Oh yes. Yes. And it's fascinating too, because because he did all the uh, mask work yep. and had to go through extreme gestures to express. Yes. 
So he's all about projecting body language. Primarily, yes, he reads too. Yeah. But I would say that he's a projector and you're a reader. Yes, that's fact. So do I ever use body language, or, you know, assertively or aggressively? Sure. I mean, you want people to trust you and believe you. I work rooms mm -hmm. by standing in front of a room and doing those kinds of things. And I, I'm ensuring that people are paying attention by engaging and engaging the last person. So I use body language that way, but not in the same way Mark would. Mark's a great coach for you know big speaking and those kinds of things for that reason. And I think what you'll find is that every time you talk to one of us, Eric, we all come to this mm -hmm. with different skill sets. And mm -hmm. none of us started off at 18 wanting to be a body language guy. We all <laughs> probably stumbled through life and found this. Actually, stuff. Chase did. Well, there you go. <laughs> Chase wanted to pick up women. So he, he went into, well, No, I mean, he, there's he, always that. That's it. He is admittedly from the pickup artist. And, you know, and we go into because I, I'm personally repulsed by that world. Right. There's Strauss because and all of that stuff. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it, it does. It, it, I have to be truthful. It does bother me because you're, you're, you're treating somebody as an object, and as soon as they're an object, that's that's a little psychopathic to me. Well, yeah. Anytime you're, and you know, let's face, kids are kids, but at some point you hopefully mm -hmm. grow, outgrow everything's about you. But I will tell you, the first time I heard of that book, the game was um, one of my people I was teaching in D.C. The guy came to me and said. Hey, have you heard of this book? And I looked at it and I said, if you need that, you're a desperate little man. And I just walked away from it. And I went back and I thought, I can write a counter to that book. And I wrote a book called The Date Decoder. It's a women's mm. dating book to have women think about themselves differently and to take some of the skills, again, from my past world, where we may have mm -hmm. one interrogator to talk to 2,000 people and we have to prioritize our needs before we talk to them and then look for deception and all that. And I, I took that approach and said, you know, you've only got so much of a life. Why would you date losers? Profile and pick the right ones and don't let people like that get you. And that book actually got me mm. into Cosmopolitan and Marie oh, nice. Claire. It was an interesting little run. Did you make it to Oprah? No, I never made it to Oprah. I would be richer if I had. <laughs> or The View? No. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't think they would like my, my personality or style. <laughs> uh, you never know. But, yeah, um, you never know. And, and to, you know, I don't want to beat him up too badly, but he also got out of the world himself and he wrote a book later called the truth mm -hmm. right and it was kind of you know going against all of it but yeah that whole that's mm, a sketchy very gross you know i think all kids when their kids want an upper hand you know there's a reason so <laughs> hypnosis and all that stuff and people always want to learn that because they want some magic power body language is the same way people want some magical power and they think that when i scratch my nose it signals something and i always say if, if you're that guy and you're looking for that that trick i'm probably not your instructor i'm a guy looking for teaching you to read baseline and look for what's deviation from that baseline and why and dig into why the person's doing that because sometimes a person will look like they're lying because they're stressed about something else true true um actually malcolm gladwell's latest book goes into that a little bit and one thing i appreciate about you is i feel like you've expressed a message that i believe you're teaching what everybody always knew but we have deliberately buried and forgotten because we're dependent on our smartphones and everything else and are incapable of reading people. You know, if you think back, when people talk about liars, they'll say somebody's a lily livered liar. You've heard that term before, thin lip mm -hmm. lies. Those are all good body language things. When, you're, when your skin goes pale, when you're telling a story, blood is leaving your skin and going to your muscles for fight or flight. There's an indicator. Your lips get thin and drawn because mucous membranes aren't needed. There's an indicator. So we've known that stuff. When they say a person knew his story forward and backward, they're telling you how to break a story. Ask backward. But we've forgotten yeah. all this because we're too focused on the world, on things, on you know whether it's a machine or software entertainment or something else. We just lost that art. Oh, in reality. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Go yeah. into the, the back things. And actually, I want to share with you on the screen, if I will, uh, a, a brief interrogation and just see what kind of read you get out of it. Okay. No pun intended. Yeah. yeah. Either, either way. Right? Okay. Are you seeing this? I can see it. Yes. I'm just going to hit play and then we'll pause and you can react to whatever you think. Sounds good. And then there we were face to face. Did you kill Greg Fall? I barely knew the man. And why would I kill him? He was a neighbor that lived 200 yards down the beach. Do you really believe that this is a vendetta by the government of Belize 
to take you down and kill you. Absolutely, sir. Can't hear. Okay, you're not getting any sound out of it? I'm not getting sound, but I already can tell you that's more than normal eye contact. Uh -huh. And eye contact for Americans is a very specific thing. And you know, eye contact in other cultures, you get a little bit more than the Middle East people have more of a hypnotic gaze kind of thing. But when people pay too much, too much eye contact makes me uncomfortable. Hmm. Okay. And you didn't hear any of the dialogue. I didn't though. hear any of the words. Nope. All right. Well, we'll just uh, skip that experiment for now. <laughs> Essentially, he was, he said, did you kill him? He said, why would I do? Oh, uh, there you go. Conditioning a question. Yeah. That was a trigger in my mind. Yeah. As soon as I heard the, why would I do that? Blah, blah, blah. That distance scene. Yep. Yep. I thought maybe there's something going on here. Well, conditioning a question of any kind is, is you know, Bill Clinton, even when he was doing a denial. Uh, I did not have sexual relations with that woman, Miss Lewinsky, right? Long drawn out before the no. That's always a good indicator. But why would I do it as a redirect gives him time to think or to do whatever? No is, you know, if you ask me that I kill someone, no is clearly the answer you get. So it, I, I think we are so accustomed to magic tricks that people think that that kind of eye contact is good. That kind of eye contact is horrible. And <laughs> it, it is... The only time someone is going to pay totally undistracted attention to you with their eyes is when they're trying to ensure that you believe what they say. And I'm going to give you an example. This is a, a parlor trick, and I, I do it all the time just because it makes people know your eyes move around. Answer this question after you pay attention to your eyes as you recall. And everybody looking can do the same thing. And pay attention to your own eyes and see what they do. I'm not looking at you. I'm seeing myself on the screen at the moment. And... Mm. What, that question is, what is the fifth word of the Star Spangled Banner? That's the uh, old NLP um, eye access and cues. And the eye access and cues from NLP, the only reason they're, they're important in this discussion is because you move your eyes when you're thinking. So when you ask a person a question and they need to think of the answer and give you details and they're staring at you, it means they've rehearsed it or they're afraid that you're going to figure out something or – that kind of hypnotic gaze is probably one of the best indicators someone's lying to you, as opposed to what most people think. Mm. That's when you move your eyes around. But when I ask you where you were on Tuesday, the 4th of July, unless it just sticks out in your memory, you probably need to rifle through your Rolodex, rifle through your pictures right. to figure out where you are. So eye contact that's hypnotic is one of the best indicators someone's lying to you. Okay, and let's let's go into the eye accessing cues just a little bit too, because I think that that has almost been overdone or overplayed in some ways that like if it's bottom left it's always this or yeah. top right yeah. it's always that could it be said that just ask the questions yes. and then watch what they do and establish whatever their pattern is and see if there's a deviation from their normal pattern yeah it's baseline everything that you're going to deal with is baseline and so if I ask you a question and you de you know you deviate from what people taught you is normal and, and the old book mm. the old book learning is up left is truth and any of this kind of thing. But the way your brain is designed, you go into different places in your head. And I'll give you three or four. Pay attention to your own eyes, everyone listening. And that first one is, uh, you know, what's the 19th word or the 16th word in the Star Spangled Banner? And most people are going to drift slightly to up and to their left as they access that sound and rifle through it. But if I mm. ask you, hey, Eric, when you talk to Scott, what did he tell you was his favorite tell? Pay attention to your own eyes now. You find your eyes drifting around. That's your baseline as you try to answer the question. And then mm. it, it's such an easy thing. When I go into corporate America and I walk into a CEO's office and I want to talk to him about something, the first thing I do is use his wall against him, right? He's got pictures of a hole at a golf course. And all I do is say, hey, where's that golf, where's that golf course and which hole is that? And then he accesses his visual memory and I've got his memory. And then I can look for deviation as he goes down the road. But you need to get a baseline because there's no such thing as a magic bullet. None of this is automatic. Not all people are wired the same, including, you know, even two people who have grown up together won't be wired the same. So you've got to get normal for that person and then look for deviation. Okay. And that actually leads into, because I'm so interested in this, there's to me a spectrum. And another guest I've had on is uh, Henry, um, Henrik Fexius, mm -hmm. and he is known as the Darren Brown of Sweden. Okay. So he's a mentalist. Yep. And what does he do? Well, he's manipulating people to extract information and things out of them. Right. He describes it further as it's not only directional, 
but it is also a tactile. Some people yes. respond to to physical things, some to smell, some to sound, some to sight. And if you can carefully shift around how they answer a question, you can go, okay, this person responds more to, did you see that swinging right. by really quickly? Or wow, that was a loud, you know, just a different well, um, tactile. Look at me, big ears, little eyes. I'm very auditory. I, <laughs> it's just a fact. So if you're if you're an auditory person, uh, my best indicators are words and sounds. When I hear something that sounds wrong, everything else turns on. My wife will often, mm. we go to parties, say, I know you don't have your tools on. Go talk to that guy and turn your tools on. Because I listen, and I try not to use this in normal, everyday life on average people, because it's a little... It's a little messy if you do, and, and people mm -hmm. feel manipulated over time, and you really don't want people to feel manipulated. But when I hear something wrong, I pay attention. And as a result, my memories are more auditory and more digital than a lot of visual things. I can walk right past visual things unless I'm really paying attention. And people remember in certain ways. You know, The, we, the old thing about how you learn visual, uh, auditory or kinesthetic, all of that stuff comes into play. And you need to take all of those pieces into play into account when you're look, talking to a person and figure out who they are. Okay. And is that why, um, and by the way, thank you for it. All your books are in audio format. Yeah. The hardest thing I've ever done, I said to someone, they, I, I like accomplishing and trying new things. Never again would I narrate my own book. I did the first two and they were abridged and it was the hardest thing I've ever done. But they're still in audio. And I mean, as somebody who does podcasting, things like that, I really appreciate it almost to the point where I won't consume unless it's an audio. Yeah, no, I've learned to do that. I, forever, I felt like I needed to read. And I find that I'm much better with audio than I am actually reading paper or looking at, at, at text. So, yeah, I think it's, it depends on how your brain is wired, right? <laughs> now, I've got a crazy reach back, but... Rules for Radicals and Saul Alinsky. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on that? Well, you know, we live in a we live in a country where freedom is a is a poisonous and dangerous thing if if it's taken too far, and if it's not taken too far, it's also poisonous and dangerous. So I, I say often that I I think we're we're headed somewhere bad because people are too focused on self, and you know, having been a military guy and those kinds of things, I. I think you should be allowed to think that way. But if that's all you think of is your opinion matters more than everybody else's, then you get into a bind. And I, I think the, the hard left and the, the, the moving in that direction is inevitable as people get more crowded, as people get closer together. And let's hope that it goes much better than, <laughs> than the experiments in the past. But radicalizing people, um, anytime that you are going out to, turn over the apple cart and have a small minority go drive for the majority. I think we have a problem. That's my opinion. And just as a final thing, because we are in the middle of a pandemic right now, what are your thoughts on the current situation and how would you recommend interacting as possible to comfort people or to, make them feel better because I mean, we're not able to interact with each other normally. Right. Yeah. You, somebody asked me today, I had a call saying, tell me something about doing body language on zoom. Well, nothing is going to be normal. You're not going to read normal body because the person is not accustomed to being in front of a camera or if they are, they know to keep their hands down and do those kinds of things. I think the biggest thing is to remember you're a human being and you need other people unless something is broken in you and you're a broken toy, you need other people in some capacity. And those other people need that same kind of companionship. I will tell you that sometimes the right answer, even in a bad situation, is not what comes to your first mind. So take a second, you know, take a beat, think about what you're saying to the person, because all of us are in different places. I, more than one person I know has lost someone very close to them as part of this. I'm not a big fan of lockdowns. And you know, I'm, I'm 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 a big fan of individual freedom, as you heard me say, and I'm fearful of what this could lead to because government doesn't like to give power back. It's just the nature of government. But mm -hmm. I would like to hope that people in power, as well as average people, learn one thing from this, and that's life is temporary. And those people around you 
are an important part of your infrastructure, you know, your personal infrastructure, and you need to pay attention, look out for those people, whether it's, whether it's just a touch, you know, as much as we are at a distance, people need to be touched It's human nature, or whether it's a word or whether it's just a note, keeping in touch and making sure that you don't let those relationships die are important. Hmm. Well, on that note, and for keeping up with the people, I do a live stream now on a pretty regular basis. And the object behind it is that the audience has an opportunity to ask questions themselves in a chat. And I was wondering, I did it with um, our Mitchell friend, Scott Rouse. Yeah. I was wondering if you would be up for doing one of those to where the audience and your audience could ask questions that they might have. I would love that, Eric. Thank you for, the, for asking. Thanks for the opportunity. Well, awesome. And now on that note, couple things that people want to check out body language tactics.com right right yep and that you can go in and get some free things if you have alexa in your house all you have to do is say alexa enable body language tactics that's alexa enable body language tactics and you'll get a couple of free lessons a week auditory your audio, audio lessons from scott wow. or me and then it will go into your i don't have it probably you know too many years in the military and that side of things i don't have that in my house but you can right. it, you can put it in your flash briefing, I think is what it's called, and get a couple of those a day. And then there are some free body language videos, and then some you can pay a few dollars and get. And we have a special for people who are locked in right now to nearly give it away so people can see what we do. Awesome. And GregoryHartley.com. Yep. That's, that's where I can find out about you. Yep. That's my homepage. It's a blog. I keep it up sometimes, and sometimes I don't, depending on how I feel. <laughs> okay. Well, Greg, thank you so much for coming on. What a pleasure. Thank you.